Well, it is a true honor to be here with all of you. Um, and it's just so awesome to be surrounded by such passionate people. It's really a true blessing to me. So this weekend, I feel like many of us come together because we recognize that something went wrong when sin entered the world. We see pain, we see oppression, we see bondage. But we also stand rooted in the truth of Jesus' liberatory mission and revolutionary spirit. And we know that another world is possible. That the way things are now are not the way things have to be. We have the power to repair what has been broken between men and women. Most of us have noticed that we do not live in a just world where men and women are truly seen as equally valuable. Women are harassed, raped, beaten, prostituted, mutilated, murdered, and sold with impunity across the globe. Even in the US, where the level of patriarchal control is often trivialized, to this day, we do not have a system that even resembles equality. And that's because I believe that equality will never be socially or politically real until the massacre of men's violence ends. Co-leadership, equal representation, women in ministry, and egalitarian relationships are crucial. But how meaningful and sustainable are those accomplishments when half the globe remains in terror? How will women have the confidence to go forth in boldness and leadership when we still have to fear for our safety? How will women feel worthy of a healthy relationship where power is shared when so many women remain powerless? How will women speak up when they've been silenced for so long? As an advocate and counselor to victims of sexual violence and trafficking, I'm exposed to some of the darkest, most vile consequences of patriarchy on a daily basis. The destruction of patriarchy is made very real. It's no longer an abstract system or a distant theory when its victims stare me in the face. It's the woman sitting across from me in my office who describes the 44 years of sexual enslavement by her own father, also a well-respected pastor who trafficked her to men in the church congregation. It's the man who sadistically batters his wife as punishment for not being the submissive woman he apparently signed up for. It's the sobs of the girl seated next to me as she's notified that there's not enough evidence that will convince a jury that she was indeed raped. Not only will that perpetrator walk free, but the last five months of crippling anxiety and post-traumatic stress she endured is invalidated. What was the point of reporting, she thinks. And it's the man who wrestles to heal from the abuse his uncle perpetrated in his childhood. He feels shame for not being strong enough to fight back. And it's the 16-year-old boy who explains that he doesn't get what's wrong with choking his girlfriend during sex. He tells me that a lot of guys do it. The videotaped sexual torture of women, also known as pornography, is now the primary sex educator of youth. These are the real experiences of my clients. This is what we're talking about as activists and academics when we say ideas have consequences. Gender is the idea. 
Violence is the consequence. Both must be eradicated. Scripture tells us that everything good comes from God. Yet women are constantly told that we're not good or we're not good enough. Patriarchal churches exclude women's full participation and emphasize our supposed defects that make us unfit for leadership. Ironically, those same churches simultaneously gush flattery about how wonderful and valuable women are in the same breath. Sure, I, I believe that they do think women are valuable. The real question is, to whom? Certainly, they believe women are valuable to men. These pastors and churches just don't seem quite as convinced that we're all that valuable to God. If complementarian and patriarchal churches truly saw women as valuable to God, their practices would be different. Their doctrines would be different. They wouldn't silence and bench half the church. They would not blockade our efforts to serve God. Actions speak louder than words. We don't need to analyze too deeply or get lost in rhetoric to know what is truly being communicated. Rarely have I personally heard blatant phrases such as, because you are a woman, you are inferior. I didn't need to. No one had to spell out those exact words for me to know them, to feel them, to internalize them. The regressive promotion of gender roles is one of the primary ways the modern church is holding us in captivity. Not only does gender limit our ability to love, become our best selves, and form healthy relationships, but gender promotes abuse. But before we continue, let's differentiate the term sex and gender. People often use these terms interchangeably, but the distinctions are important to eliminate potential confusion. Sex is a biological reality. Male and female God created us. However, gender is a social construction created by men, often re referred to as masculinity or femininity. When I speak to groups, I often do an activity to get the audience thinking about what gender is and what it means. We call it the gender box. So first I'll ask the boys and men in the room, what does it mean to be a man in our culture? So I'll give the example of when someone says man up or even grow a pair, what are they saying? Or I invite them to think of the manliest man they can think of and ask how he behaves. Now I make it clear that I'm not asking for ideals. I'm asking about what masculinity actually is in reality. And so we start filling up the box. And these are the answers that I most typically receive. So let's just take a moment to read over this and let this sink in. So as we can see, we've got tough, strong, emotionless, control, power, wealth, aggression, violence, competition, anger, dominance, forceful, warrior, and sensitive. One of the things that I find interesting is that the audience I speak to does not be, affect the outcome of what falls in this box. I've done this activity with both secular and Christian audiences, professionals, community members, young, old, victims, and offenders. Across the board, the definition of masculinity is near universal. So when we look at this box, why are we surprised when we see men perpetrate widespread violence. 
If we look at this box, they are simply conforming, not deviating from the status quo of what it means to be a man. So how could men's violence not be happening? The socialization of men in patriarchy is a grooming and breaking process of turning boys into stoic soldiers, even abusers and accomplices. This process is cruel and strips boys and men of their ability to empathize, where they detach emotionally, become indifferent to the suffering of others, and deny the humanity in themselves and others. In a patriarchal system, men define the rules and punish the violators. So that also means that at any moment, men have the capacity to change this system. Unfortunately, we find that many perceive the benefits to outweigh the harm. Patriarchy is upheld primarily through male solidarity, which is an agreement among men to both actively oppress women and passively be silent when other men do. So regardless of a man's direct involvement, Privileges and benefits are still reaped by all men, just as all white people reap privileges due to the oppression of people of color. Silence or even neutrality is an active choice that sustains these exploitative systems. And now with femininity. Femininity is socialized subordination. It is both the psychological and sociological adaptation, a survival response rooted in the historical trauma caused by patriarchy and men's violence. It is born from the breaking and seasoning process from a position of powerlessness and even victimization. Psychologist D. Graham believed that if male violence and patriarchy ended, so would femininity. Although some women have not had violence directed at them personally, we know the stories of what happened to other women. Not only that, but depictions of men's violence against women are saturated in our culture. The media and a $100 billion a year violent porn industry that derives both profit and pleasure from women's pain. Even more insulting, when this sexual exploitation is videotaped, it's all of a sudden legal and rebranded as adult entertainment or free speech. What is so uniquely disturbing about pornography is that it's the public sexual humiliation of women. His rape of her doesn't go far enough. It must be documented. Pornography is undeniably one of the most powerful and popular forms of misogynistic propaganda. Statistics range, but a lot of the current stats say around 70 to 90% of men are regular porn users. As a woman, simply knowing that most men are sexually aroused by our torture and suffering is traumatizing in and of itself. To know this to be true and remain unaffected as a woman is unlikely at best. The purpose of female socialization and patriarchy is to break the spirit of a woman, to create a compliant, obedient class to uphold patriarchy. So let's see how this process works. To explain how we move from a place of hierarchy to violence, sometimes that seems like a big jump. 
Andrea Dworkin, a famous second wave feminist, came up with a theory called the four elements of subordination. We're going to go through that. I've adapted and expanded on some of these elements. So first, the foundation we start at is hierarchy. The system of patriarchy revolves around an obsession with maintaining power, authority, and control. One of the tools or means of male rule is the construction of the sex-based hierarchy, also known as gender, where men are on top and women are on the bottom. And this hierarchy is based on our reproductive organs. Therefore, it's a fixed and unchangeable caste system. Difference is then used to justify this hierarchy as either natural or God-ordained. In the system of racism, it's skin color. In the system of patriarchy, it's genitalia and reproductive capacity. These differences are then used as the basis for subordination. And then we move up to objectification. As soldiers are trained to dehumanize those they're ordered to harm or kill, men are similarly trained to dehumanize women. Human beings were not created to kill. Anyone would feel great distress when violating or hurting someone because they're a human being made in the image of God. So in order to carry this out, one must first believe that the person they're harming is not made in God's image and is inferior or subhuman. We see this all the time. Women and girls are reduced to objects, to commodities, and her personhood is denied. In this objectification process, her identity is no longer fixed and unchangeable in Christ, but is shaped and validated by external sources, mainly her sexual, reproductive, and domestic use by men. Women are then deemed worthy by their usability, sold as incubators in advertisement, pageants, pornography, and prostitution. We find in Genesis, not as God's original vision, but as a result of sin after the fall, that patriarchy and sin become systematized. Genesis 3.16 states, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And we're still recovering the consequences of the fall. Women are still socialized to please men at all costs. And then we move up to submission. So once she internalizes the subjectification, absorbs the patriarchal mindset, and believes the propaganda of her own inferiority, she then surrenders out of a survival response or for submission. Cooperation with oppressors is an adaptation to the social context of patriarchy's ever-present threat to women. So at this point, Submission appears to be the best option, or even the safer route. Now, this is one of the most profound falsehoods of patriarchy. The lie is that if women just comply, we'll all be better off. Submission by women to men gives women the comforting illusion that if we were just more loving, more respectful, more pleasing, more attractive, or more sexually available, maybe, just maybe, men will be satisfied and won't hurt us. But if that were the case, if men did not hurt the women they love, then domestic violence would not exist. Instead, men in intimate relationships with women in patriarchy often feel the highest levels 
of entitlement, whether it's to her body, her time, or her labor. Statistically, the closer she gets to a man, the more in danger she becomes from his violence. Intimacy with men and patriarchy is not protection for many women. Instead, it's a risk factor. So what's interesting is then oppressors use an oppressed group's submission as justification for their oppression. The oppressors point to women's submission, they'll naturalize it, and claim that, you know, these subordinates just chose their place in life. They wanted it all along, or they even like or get a sexual thrill from their subservience. Again, this is the premise of pornography and the ever-increasingly popular BDSM where power inequality in sex is eroticized and even celebrated, the political then becomes personal. And then we get to violence. So violence is used to control, terrorize, make an example of, and punish those who resist or do not comply. And it's important to note that this violence does not need to be constant. Lear Keith states that oppressors, quote, can't stand over vast numbers of people 24 hours a day with guns. Those consequences only have to be applied once in a while to be effective. The traumatized psyche will then police itself, end quote. So this is how we arrive at femininity, or the traumatized psyche. So gender is not simply a collection of stereotypes, labels, and categorizing. Gender serves a larger function. Its function is to justify and legitimize patriarchy to maintain male supremacy. Lear Keith simply describes the definition of gender as who gets to be human and who gets hurt. Gender is organized and displayed in many different ways. Gender distinctions are used to clearly establish and differentiate the oppressors from the oppressed through sex-specific rules, dress, expression, supposed personality differences, behavior, etc. The irony of Christians who cling to gender roles is that gender is cultural, not biblical. Jesus never told us to mold and fit into society's box or uphold the status quo. In fact, scripture states the opposite. We're told in Romans 12 to, to not conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed and discern the will of God. Jesus calls us, both male and female, to imitate him, not imitate culturally constructed expectations of how men and women should behave. So if we revisit this man box in particular, how many of these characteristics look like Jesus? Not only did Jesus not fit most of these characteristics, he passionately opposed them. So as followers of Jesus, we are called to do the same. Our culture says men should be powerful and controlling. Christ gave up his power and privilege as a servant to all. Our culture says men should dominate. Christ spoke about the danger of hierarchy and the corruption of power. Our culture glorifies men's violence. Jesus was crowned the Prince of Peace. Our culture says men should be competitive. Christ said the first will finish last. Our culture encourages the attainment of wealth 
And Christ says the love of money was the root of all evil and spoke against our addictive greed. Our culture says men must be the provider. Christ was dependent on the financial provision of women. Our culture says men should be emotionless and insensitive. Yet Christ was filled with tender compassion and expressed emotion in healthy ways, including weeping in public. How many men in our culture are comfortable with that? Jesus proclaimed his personal mission statement in Luke 4.18. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. When we revisit the gospel, we see there was no necessity for Jesus to go on a feminist rant to rebel against patriarchy, as much as I love those. He demonstrated his rebellion with his life. In Matthew 20, 25 through 28, Jesus disrupts the social order of the time. His message was just as radical then as it is now. Verse 25, Jesus called them together and said, quote, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus challenged those in power to renounce their position at the top of the pyramid. Not so with you, he said. As followers of Christ, the kingdom of God is not of this world. We do not cling to control, status, or temporary gains that will never last, because these amount to nothing in the end. Jesus knew something we still haven't figured out quite yet, that there is freedom when we abandon control. This desire for control stems from deep-rooted fear, but God's perfect love casts out all fear. When we talk about equality, we don't mean equal opportunity of men and women to dominate and control. We want women and men disrupting abusive systems of power and countering the culture in radical service to others, just as Jesus did. When we follow the footsteps of Christ, our behaviors as men and women will not look all that different because the fruits of the Spirit are the same for all believers. These are not sex-specific or gendered. Right this moment, we're living in a culture where we see widespread distress in regards to gender. Some churches have responded in a regressive revival of strict gender roles. Others have offered alternative solutions to improve gender or attempt to make it less rigid. One common solution is to simply redefine masculinity or femininity. Another is to view gender as a spectrum where people can be both masculine and feminine to varying degrees at varying times. While these may look like advancement, in both solutions, we are told to affirm those gender boxes as true, but instead just offer more expansive options. But when gender is a hierarchy, then gender is inherently harmful. It cannot be repaired, become less toxic, or made more healthy because gender is the tool used to preserve female subordination. 
So expanding the gender box simply means we live in a bigger cage. Sure, it may be a bit more diverse, comfortable, or roomier, but ultimately we're still in bondage. Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And I don't know about you, but I am tired of living in a cage. I don't want healthier gender or nicer patriarchy. <laughs> patriarchy is not nice or healthy. It is, it is wrong. It is sin. And it is mass destruction. Now, few would argue that we made a mistake by fighting for the abolition of slavery and making it illegal. We didn't fight to simply improve conditions for slaves. We recognize the absurdity of this because the system of slavery is nefarious, irredeemable, and intrinsically immoral. No matter how good the PR, no matter how nicely it was rebranded, no matter what exceptional circumstances were used to justify it, no matter what propaganda was used to promote it. We had a collective, social, and spiritual responsibility to abolish racial enslavement, and we have the same responsibility now with patriarchal enslavement. So why do we continue wrapping ourselves in chains? Why does the very oppressive system that Jesus came to redeem us from endure and continue? And what can we do to stop it? There are many ways to counter patriarchy. So there are handouts and cards located at the end of the registration table with more ideas, looks like this, but I will just highlight a few things. First and foremost, we need to address men's violence, exploitation, and abuse. This is the foundation. Any further attempts at replacing patriarchy with an egalitarian system will crumble and be held back when our most basic need for safety is not met. We need to create a safe space for survivors where they are believed, validated, and do not fear retaliation for coming forward. It means that we recognize anyone, and I mean anyone, is capable of abuse. Even people we love, admire, and respect. It means that we hold abusers accountable in the church. No victim blaming, no excuses, no justifications. Full responsibility rightfully on the abuser alone. This also means that men as a whole must be accountable and learn from women. I invite men here to ask the women in your life how sexism, men's violence, and the constant threat of rape affects them and those they love. Asking women about their experiences can be eye-opening. Listen and refrain from defensiveness. Validate their experiences and ask how you personally can be a safer man to them. In addition, this requires that men end the re enduring legacy of male silence and solidarity against women. Speak up when men are being sexist and abusive. No doubt it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be challenging. But the cost of your silence is women's lives. Second, we need to disrupt the gender system. Resisting social pressures and gender shaming to conform to masculinity and femininity. Our human experience, strengths, 
personalities and gifts cannot fit into one socially constructed gender box. Gender creates a hierarchy and builds the foundation for abuse. Jesus, as our model, busted the box and rebelled against gender roles, rejecting the lies of patriarchy. In addition, extra attention should be focused on encouraging and supporting women, especially women of color. Because as we went through Dworkin's subordination process, women have far more barriers to overcome. We have been socialized into subservience, into pleasing, dulling our voices and questioning our callings. Finally, we as a church should be at the forefront of the fight against patriarchy, not trailing behind the feminist movement. The church holds immense power. With this power comes great responsibility to reconcile and repair the damage done in the name of Jesus. We must challenge false interpretations of scripture, normalize egalitarian theology, and correct those who cite Bible verses to justify the subordination of women. As Christ followers, we are called to imitate Jesus as our model for a better world, a world that values power with, not power over. Male rule is a consequence of sin. Human dignity must be restored. Let us never resign ourselves or settle for a lesser version than what God has promised. Because my sisters deserve to live in a world where we can walk freely, where we do not have to live in fear, where our boundaries are respected and our voices are amplified, where we can be all God has called us to be, where we can experience the true freedom that Jesus promised. The chains are broken, the veil was torn, and the bars of this cage must come crashing down. Because as Jesus said in John 8:36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Thank you.